Hi everybody, we're going to talk about a film from 1997 that got it kind of sandwiched in uh, throughout the great other movies of 1997 like Titanic, Goodwill Hunting, a lot of them, but kind of get lost in it. Um, crit critics had it always in their top ten. It got a Best Director nomination and Best Adapted Screenplay, but I think people over the time kind of forgot about it as well. Yeah, it probably has to do something with the title doesn't have that catch to it. You know, yeah, it doesn't really the, grab the audience. And the content is kind of hard to talk uh, Exactly, yeah. See. So all around, it's one of those movies that is not the crowd pleaser. I think it was listed on on Most Dangerous Films list, Premier Magazine, sure. one of the 20 Most Dangerous it's... Films, because it's not there for your consumption and getting away. Yeah, We're going to be talking about the dreary drama with a hint of life. I like that. Let's go with it. Sweet Hereafter. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. Hi everybody, I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us, thanks for watching, and for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. Yes, we do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals and content, and get to tell us what movies we should review in the future. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out the webpage for critics reviews as well as ours, and today we're talking about uh, what was considered uh, one of the top ten films of the year in 1997. Roger Ebert considered the best film in 1997. It's The Sweet Hereafter. Yeah, so a small town has been torn apart when a tragic school bus accident leads to the deaths of 14 children. Lawyer Mitchell Stevens arrives in town to help build a lawsuit, but he finds his task difficult as he confronts a town with an ecosystem of secrets. Okay, so it's based on the book by uh, Russell Banks with the same title. In the book, it's uh, the place is upstate New York. Here, it's in Canada. Yeah, um, I don't think it's ever even really stated. Like, I mean, the assumed place is Canada because our director is, but I don't even know if they ever really state any location at all. <laughs> all right, I don't, you can try to maybe parts in Alaska, parts whatever, but yeah. it's, it's a it's an eco right ecosystem is the right word because it's a little uh, town mm -hmm. that's kind of interconnected. They're all it's a small town. They all know about each other. They all hate each other, but they all like each other. Mm -hmm. um, this film is about the tragedy of a bus going into the lake and all the kids died except for one, which is Sarah Polly playing Nicole Burnell. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie takes a long time for me to unweave because it's like a coil. And Rodrigo is right. It's like a coil of slow entanglement of everything is going to be drowned out. It's not about the case. Mm -hmm. It's not about the tragedy, but it's about the after effects. Yeah, and it's yeah, I think it's purposeful in trying to kind of reorganize the events a little bit so that you are a little lost. Yeah. Um, because it does lead questions of, you know, like they, they present us with locations like the plane. They present us with Mitchell yeah. on the ground. They present us with the before and with some of the aftermath. And they purposely move it around a little bit to kind of keep you a little lost in the narrative. I feel like that's a, you know, probably by design because the narrative would be fairly straightforward. Yes. Maybe lose a little bit of its dynamic reveal process. Now every single time we jump through time, we get a little bit more of a nugget of information. So it's directed by Adam Awogen. Uh Screenplay by him. He adapted it. He got nominated for Best Adapted and Best Director. Uh, edited by somebody he continues works with, with Susan Shipton, and the same cinematographer that he continues work with as well, which is Par Sorossi. Um, both of them went on to do films like Chloe, Felicity's Journey, and Devil's Not. Devil's Not Feet, I think, is with Reese Witherspoon. Mm. I haven't had an opportunity to see any of those films, so if you have a want us to review those films in the future, please put a comment down or join the Patreon and tell us what's up. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie is uh, stars Ian Holm. I think this is actually a... I think he got a lot of awards away from the Academy, like BAFTA, mm. um, kind of going like Golden Globes. Yeah, and, and he was a late addition, actually, because Donald Sutherland was attached for ver until very close to filming. Okay. Uh, and then Holm took over, and Holm said, like, it was shocking because I'm at the age I'm at, I think he was, what, 65 at the time, and he got his first leading role. This is his first <laughs> leading role in a right. film where he is the top build star, which is just absolute insanity. I had to scroll through a ton of his movies afterwards. So I was like, he's got to have led something, right? And I couldn't no, find No, he's always one. a supporting actor <laughs> yeah. nomination. He's always the bridesmaid. Including Lord of the Rings. He's always yeah. a supporting actor. So this is actually the opportunity for Ian Holm to shine. He does very well reserved acting. Mm -hmm. I don't think he lets the other people... It's kind of like how you let the environment and the other people around you absorb you in in a reactionary tone. Mm. But it's very subtle. Even when I like the dialogue when he has a conversation with his daughters. It's very distant. He always portrays that very distant relationship with other people. Yeah, he seemed to have a, a reserved emotional 
response in this film, which I think is kind of funny because Ian Holm, if you look at just the, the, the trajectory of his career, he is physically changes in every single film and he yeah. mentally and emotionally changes in every film. Like you Fifth look, Element. Yeah, two years prior with Fifth Element, he's doing a movie where he's almost dancing around that film. He's moving with such speed and, and you know, frenetic energy and he's he's so vocal and energetic and then you get this film. And then yeah. when this was coming out, he was probably starting on filming Lord of the Rings at that point. That's That took several years to film. And then in that film, he's got a little bit more energy because he's, you know, up and dancing at his party and stuff. He's doing stuff. But this movie, you can see the physical age that his character has. When he gets up from a situation, you can see the, the, the slight changes in his movement. Like, he just embodies people so very well. Yeah. And here, he lets the other people, he projects the anger. He tries to get them to attach to his emotions. Mm -hmm. And people are still grieving. This is a movie kind of about grief that's kind of hard to digest. Uh, this is also stars Sarah Pauly. Sarah Pauly is directing and writing a movie that called Women Talking. It comes out in a couple of weeks as we record. Mm -hmm. um, her, Tom McCann is, Bruce Grinwood is in this. We yeah, nice unrecognizable in this film. <laughs> Cast because he didn't look as pretty as the guy that they were looking at originally. Which I think is funny because <laughs> that man is handsome. But <laughs> And then we have uh, Gabriel Rose, who has, if you look up Gabriel Rose, has a wonderful accomplishment resume of acting. She's won a bunch of awards. She's, look up the movie Excited. It's a Canada exclusive release. She won a bunch of awards for that. And she plays the bus driver Dorothy in mm -hmm. this. And she's another one of those phenomenal actors. I think you get a really good, when her and Ian Holm together, it's wonderful bouncing off each other performances. Yeah, it's funny when you see her because it, she wasn't someone I immediately could register a name for, but you can register remembering seeing her. You know, she's done smaller films. She's done bigger budget things like Jennifer's Body or Time Cop. She has a plethora of acting awards on television. That's usually right. just on episodes somewhere. She oftentimes, I've seen her at least three times playing a therapist. <laughs> um, but but she's she's got that wide berth of, of performances yeah. that this was probably the biggest role I've ever seen her in right. that had the most impact. And it was nice to see an actress who has done character work for so much of her career and it has that under recognition be able to play a role as significant as Dorothy. Ah, and it uh, goes on to another star set of cast because you have a bunch of people who have, not, have done movies after this as well. I think the hippie parents, are the, the, the well, some of them haven't done a lot of accomplished careers. I think the, the wife from the hippie family. Yeah, the wife. The, yeah, so yeah. she was the one who the, gave the, him the book. <laughs> I'm the one, uh, the husband. Yeah. I can't find anything about the guy who plays the husband of the hippie family. Who has a great cabin that's at that. Yeah, I know he appeared in things like Land of the Dead and Battlefield Earth, but just not in a role that's, yeah. you know, findable. You know, or else you get someone like Alberta Watson, who we've seen in films like The Keep, we've seen her in The Lookout, um, playing uh, the, the woman who runs the hotel. Yes. Uh, who's having the affair. Like, we've seen her in a number of things, but again, never had that leading role, never had that noticeable, like, got you in the trades kind of a role. Um, but she does fine work in, in everything as well. So overall, I would just want to give you a background about the plot and kind of how he constructs this movie because it's not about the case really, but you have this lawyer who's kind of lost himself. Mm -hmm. Also, with he kind of signed that maybe I can, you kind of tell that if I get this case, maybe I can accomplish some good because he has his daughter that's a drug addict who just only cares about him is this, give me money. Yeah. And she's this self-absorbed and he's kind of already done with the intervention he's done with everything kind of with he's her he's cut her off now and at this point she has to change in order to get back she yeah. has to actually get clean on her own because he can't do anymore and that's that's a that's been a frequent like recent story plot point because there's been a lot of trauma around drug addiction in recent film yeah. um, and it's something that it's interesting to see that it was still kind of prevalent in 97 as well and it's, the conversations are so distant but it's, it's subplot is so poignant for the movie because every time he has a conversation with it he's just like my daughter. <laughs> well, and it's almost so like an that's interruption. His, that's yeah. his character. I mean, like yeah. we don't learn about his character much through the interviews because we're not focused on him. He is our almost our expositional reader at that point. He's yeah. getting the details from them so that we can learn more about the events. We get a little yeah. bit of his insight through how he interacts with people, but it the bulk of it is those interactions with his daughter or on the plane, which was a much expanded subplot from the novel. It, it, there's some significant shuffling of events in the novel, expansion yep. of a few things, a couple characters that had a bit more going on. Yep. Uh, and then I think the Pied Piper illusions, the was, Robert Browning thing was added, added into the, the film. Um, and so Ian's character is dealing with some kind of grieving. 
as well that he knows the situation with the daughter is going to eventually end up. Mm -hmm. um, you have what is very softly played is the sexual abuse with Sarah Pauly's character, Nicole. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's touched on and then f almost like, I don't want to say forgotten, but just not ever mentioned again to the yeah. point where it's like, wait, did I just see that? Like, I had to stop myself and go, did I just see what I was seeing? Yes. Or do I need to rewind? I don't want to rewind. I don't rewind. <laughs> you know? It's the awkward moment in the barn. Yeah. But yeah. It is the catalyst to the story. It is the reason why Nicole lies in her disposition to get the lawsuit going. Mm -hmm. It's the, because she, she, for her, she doesn't die, but she loses all functions of her body. And rather than knowing that now my entire body, I have no control over it, that my dad has now control can do everything he wants to it. Mm. The only avenue I can get back at him is to ruin the lawsuit for yeah. him. And it's not projected out loud. It's very softly played on it. Yeah. So it's very hard. I'm, you have to watch it three times, like, what is going on, until you realize she's viscerating him any way she can. Because mm. she's he's treating like a princess. Now he, she's like a little ornament that he can do, you know. Yeah. yeah. And she also, she... He's, he comes to realize that she holds the cards in that situation because she has started to realize that she has more agency in her choices in life. And he can't tell anybody why she's lying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's the functionality as we get kind of towards that ending is that we spend a lot of little bits of time with all these people. I believe, too, the incest subplot is yeah. more prevalent in the book. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and the decision, again, in reshuffling events is to put that later on so that we don't have it up front and center at the beginning. Again, it's well, yeah, it's, well, it's shocking, shocking but, yeah. and it also it takes away from the narrative about the school bus because all of a sudden we're like, wait, we, we need clarification on this. We need answers for this. Like, And it's very you know, flashy. The, the, the bus scene is probably the only flashy thing in the movie of the cut mat, oh, format yeah. of the mat and how they got that scene of Bruce... Green was watching it in the lake. Yeah, for a lower budget film, it looks pretty good for '97. I mean, you can yeah. tell you can tell if you really you know look in there that it's it's, it's matte, you know, matte painting kind of format. And it's yeah. almost you know felt a little bit you know, like the South Park thing where you have a little bit of like you know paper that we're like moving down almost, but yeah. it works pretty well. It's pretty successful so, for yeah. a low budget film. So up next, overall, is our review of the Sweet Hereafter. Let's see if it still sustains. So this is first time Kyle's ever seen this movie, so I'd like to hand the keys off to him to kind of give his review first, uh, since this is his first time watching it, or even actually knowing about this movie. I knew the title. Okay. Uh, I knew it was a tragedy. Um, yeah. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is um, a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's got that kind of title almost where like you know like remains of the day where it's like that doesn't gather you at all. Like it doesn't tell you anything about the film. It doesn't grab you and pull you in. And really, if this movie wasn't up for Oscars. I don't know that that title would really grab anybody in the future. Right, you're not going to buy a suite here after Lunchbox. Right? Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, but what I, what I really like to see about a film is I like to see an actor like an Ian Holmes, someone who's, who's done great character work, get the opportunity to shine yeah. amongst a bunch of other great character actors. Yeah, Bruce Greenwood um, does a lot of... I mean, he's he surprised that he didn't get like a supporting role. But I understand 1997, that is a lot. I mean... You got Robert Williams up for supporting. Yeah. You got you know Titanic to deal. Well, with. and what we forget too is that in the '90s we didn't have this little thing called streaming. So all of your movies went to theaters if they wanted to have an opportunity to Oscars. So we we think about the '90s and like 2000. We think about all these decades prior as being like so much more front loaded with great movies. And it's like today we have them, they just never really get seen because after a week of being out, they're buried by the next thing. Yeah. Uh, this movie has more time to breathe, I think, in that way. And so that's one of the benefits and I think one of the reasons why it circulated so well. I love the cast of the film. Uh, we didn't talk about Maury Chaikin, who's another really great character actor. He plays the, the guy that's running the hotel with his wife, played by Oh, yeah, he's the salty guy. Um, he steals from my antiques and resells them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, he's basically the thesis statement of the film. Is like you know, when they're right. asking his, every single character, right. he has thoughts on everyone, which yeah. is exactly how small towns are. The film felt almost like if you took a Stephen King small town main film and took the horror out. Like there's still horror in that way, just it's not like the after Stephen King the horror. horror. Yeah, it's after needful things, after the devil's there. Yeah, there's yeah. no Pennywise here. It's a school bus, but like the things that are still there are still prevalent. Small towns have secrets. And when strangers enter them, we're not sure if we should give. I like that. I no. I, I didn't think about the Donna give, the give that. A, yeah, I see it much more like that. Right. It's it reminded after the me of that that miniseries from the '90s, actually probably from '97, called the, the Storm of the Century, which was about yeah, a small town that holds a very dark secret after the storm comes through. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's how this film kind of felt to me. Um, yeah, great performances across the board. I was really taken with, and I didn't. 
I'm not going to say I loved it when I first heard it, but when I finished the film, I really loved this element of it, and that was the music. Uh, the choice to have Michael Dana do a film that's not really that's more of a timeless score doesn't yeah. feel like it has that time. like Fargo like it just yeah it just once in a while pops in there and it's very like foreboding it's very like after effect yeah I think he said that the score was a medieval tone a uh, timeless tone yeah. that was kind of given in there and that's true because I had gotten to the point where until they put the 97 like the the calendar <laughs> on the wall I'd yeah. forgotten what year this movie had come out like I just wasn't in my head I wasn't right. thinking this is a 97 movie it could have been a movie from last year outside of the actors who passed on you know it could have yeah. been something that was just recently just unearthed the old fashioned cell phones and yeah. Like yeah but then when you see the 97 you're like oh that's right this movie came out a long time ago you know <laughs> So another reason um, for a while uh, I did not put this uh, when we did our retrospective of 1997 why I did not put this on my top 10 simply because I think it's a very for all the things that we I like about the movie it's very forgettable. Mm. It's and how you do that with a story that's so hard to digest and so like I talk about that but we went back to let's talk about 1997 films and I went back and like oh yeah that movie it kind of lo- fell off my radar. And I think that's the reason it's not for me. A, it's a very forgettable film. I think after three or four years, you're like, yeah, that's that movie. I, and you forget about all the great scenes in it. You have to almost rewatch it because there's great shots in this movie. I love the direction of the movie. Mm. There's that, when the disposition, that tracking shot is in there. Yeah. You got some great scenes of just Bruce Greenwood and Ian Holm at the bus. The bus. And then yeah. and Bruce Greenwood going to confront uh, Sam and... Uh, his wife about like de- deposing themselves, having their daughter be deposed for this. Yeah. You know that kind of. In, you, you have know. some great camera work here, mm-hmm. but for me, uh, you know, like I haven't seen it for 1997. I completely almost forgot about it. I think yeah. part of it though is that it's it's kind of like Sully, that Clint Eastwood film about Sullenberger, yeah. where the event itself, like the event that is the trigger for the entire narrative, is very not part of the narrative. And I think that's intentional. Yeah. Like we're not we're not there to watch the horror of this because we know it's going to eventually result in fourteen dead children. Right. You it's, know the camera's away from the bus, but you can hear the kids. But we're not going to zoom in on the kids. Yeah. Drowning in the bus. Exactly. Or, you know, yeah. it's not one of those things where we don't want to see that. But at the same time, having it so and move to to later in the film as well. That happened in yeah. Sully. We don't see the actual like plane rescue at the beginning of that film. We see it near the end of the film as yeah. it's being compiled through mm-hmm. memories. As we know when what's going to happen. Yeah, so we yeah. know where it's leading the whole time, but having the event, being able to see the event puts it in your mind more, and that makes it more of that memorable experience. Um, I also yeah. think, to be honest, I see what the idea is and what they're going for with that ending with, uh, what is it, uh, Nicole Serapoli's character? Yeah. I don't think it works as well because in in doing the, spoiler alert, in lying and saying that, you know, the, the driver was the one who was at fault. Yeah. Now you are putting the driver at potential lawsuits. And it doesn't sound like she would want to put Dorothy in those potential lawsuits of no. driving too fast. It just seems to me like I don't think that's something that Nicole would do. She wouldn't lie in that way. I get the why. I get the execution. Well done execution. I just don't like the choice. I don't think the choice meets it's her character. And played very softly. You need something of a punch to get back at her dad because we still – like. We still don't, they didn't project it much more harshly of what is going on with her. Yeah. It's very projected softly to engage what she's really doing is viscerating. Yeah. yeah. And I think lifting up her character more as she comes back into play, because I think, you know, she's, she's a background character for the first half of the film. Right. And then when she wakes up, she enters the narrative as a full-fledged, like, main character with yep. Ian Holm. Um, but we spend so much time with uh, Ian Holm as Mitchell Stevens, I don't know that his character got a... a good enough closure to his story and I don't know that Nicole was lifted up enough in the second half of the narrative that makes her final decision the climax of the film because we're still following Mitchell so a few things here and there that I think don't stick the landing the way that I wanted them to but a lot of things in that first half where it's just gunning for a you know really powerful landing and right it's the deposition at the end that feels just a little stale where you need it to get the big boom out of it yeah and you see him, I'm sure, talking. She's lying, and she's going right, looking at her dad. And you see Ian Holm just like, all right, we're, we're deflated. We're done. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, and that's and, kind of the ending of it, right? Yeah. And the director said that the, one of the biggest questions he gets from the film 
is about the stenographer's mask, which I've, I've always been aware of watching a lot of courtroom dramas, but the woman yeah. with the mask on who's taking notes because she's speaking into this thing and not trying to ruin the deposition by taking those notes. He says that's the biggest question he gets, and I think to myself, that's the problem is when when your ending doesn't have that punch, people you focus look, on the details. details. They focus on these weird things like, is that a super villain with the little mask on or yeah. something? David Lynch can, can get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Because yeah. people are focused on the details then. <laughs> right, you know? right, yeah. So, have you seen The Sweet Hereafter? Yeah, let us know your thoughts on the film down below. Uh, or are you like me, you completely forgot the movie after 25 years? And yeah, watch the first 10 minutes, then you'll know if you've seen it. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there another Adam Egoin film that you want us to cover? I know he just had one of his films at the Criterion Collection. He's also well-known for Chloe, Exotica, a number of other films as a director and writer. Uh, one of his rare adaptations here. So let us yeah. know if there's another film we need to cover on the show down in the comments. Yeah. Uh, while you're down there, please like and subscribe. They don't cost you anything. Here, two seconds. Done. You can do it for us. It's really easy. And while you're down there, please check out that Patreon link as well. We'd love to have you join the team and tell us what to cover next. Um, yeah, that's our favorite thing is not having to not having to pick and having you pick for us. Uh, thank you guys for joining us, and you can find all my film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. You can find my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts.